All right, everybody, welcome. My name is Eric Kingston with the Idaho Housing and Finance Association, and I run the Housing Information Referral Hotline. I've uh, worked for several years on fair housing issues and issues around access uh, throughout the state and represent IHFA on the Idaho Fair Housing Forum, which is how I've gotten to know Eric Steven and David Penny over the years and uh, really enjoy working with these two. So I'm glad you're able to join us today. I uh, also want to recognize Christina Carlos, who's helped with registration and uh, getting certificates out to everybody. Uh, is no small task, and I uh, really appreciate all of her help and support. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with just a few introductory slides, not going to take up too much time, uh, and then we're going to turn these two guys loose on some of your questions. And what we've, what we've found in the sessions we've done in the fall last year and this spring, a lot of people have lots of questions and it's pretty tough to get to all of them. So we thought, why not create a, a forum where you can just basically pose questions that are kind of top of mind for you and reflect some of the issues that you're looking at, uh, you know, in your region. And these guys will uh, give their best, their best shot at uh, responding to that and suggesting, you know, how you, how you uh, might think about some of those. I'd like to welcome Brian Dale from HUD. Good to see you, Brian. Okay, Brian is the uh, founder uh, of the Idaho Fair Housing Forum many years ago. So we've kind of had some time to work on that together. It's been really nice. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen. There we go. Just to make sure you're in the right place, this is the uh, 2021 Fair Housing Webinar, and we're going to talk about current events, your questions, and everything fair housing related. Okay, go to the next. There we go. I want to just put this disclaimer up here. Um, this work and the project here have been funded in part by a grant from uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and uh, the the findings and the work are dedicated to the public. Um, and we don't hold them responsible for anything that we say. So there. And then the next disclaimer, this is another disclaimer because, you know, we can't have enough. Um, today's uh, session really is kind of informational. It's not meant to represent any kind of legal advice for any specific cases. So take a look at that uh, disclaimer there and hopefully everybody understands that and uh, and uh, accepts that um, these guys are going to do their best to, to talk about their experience in the past and with the uh, case law that they know about. Um, but this is not a substitute for um, an actual review of your case. Okay, so this is just the housekeeping piece. Um, please use the chat feature. If you have questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. We'll try and get to those as, as best we can. Uh, we did send out a survey or Christina sent out a survey uh, and some of you responded, so we have an idea of some, you know, some of the priorities there. Um, please keep yourself muted. And if you have a need for a certificate after this, you can email Christina. And I want to give a shout out. This was from our 2009 Idaho Fair Housing Forum uh, art contest and calendar. And Hannah Wilson was the winner from Bora High School. And her, her artwork and others, other uh, art was featured in that calendar. We hope to maybe replicate that again sometime, but I thought that was kind of a nice, nice piece of art. What is fair housing? This is just, you know, for the folks who haven't, uh, you know, kind of refreshed lately, uh, the right of all people to be free from discrimination in the rental, sale, or financing of housing, anything to do with housing, basically. Uh, and you can kind of see, you know, some of these other options. When I say what it means, um, it's illegal to treat a person differently in any housing transaction because that person belongs to or is perceived as being a member of a protected class. The reason I point that out is uh, my ex-wife had a situation in Logan. She went to Utah State. Um, what are they, Aggies? Is that is that their thing? Yeah, okay, Eric knows. And um, she lived across the street from the, um, the Logan Temple and she used to get really suntan in the summer and her neighbors complained to her 90 year old landlady that they didn't think it was appropriate for a black woman to live across the street from the Logan temple. 
Well, she's Sicilian, but she has very dark skin. So um, that's what I mean by saying someone who is perceived as being a member of protected class. Um, and you can see those protected classes listed to the right. And then I put an asterisk next to gender. And from the warden memo that was published on February 11th of this year, um, HUD is basically reflecting uh, you know, what was decided in the Bostock decision when it comes to um, labor and employment, that uh, gender also includes sexual orientation and gender identity in HUD programs. So I'll let these guys kind of talk about the particulars of that. Uh, we're going to probably cover various aspects of these three federal laws. Uh, you all are familiar with the Fair Housing Act, I believe, by now. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act just means if you've got a program or an activity or service a uh, facility that has federal money, a federal, federal funding tied to it, um, you cannot deny access to somebody solely on the reason of a, of a disability. And then the ADA, of course, covers uh, the public built environment and uh, areas of public accommodation. And these guys will talk a little bit more about that as we go through. Uh, oops, that's a duplicate there. And uh, then this is a, a, just a page of resources and links and I will have make sure that this is uploaded to the fairhousingforum.org page. We've got a special page for the spring uh, fair housing webinars, and you can refer to that for links, and we'll post additional information uh, that comes up during this conversation. Again, I'd love to introduce Eric Stephen from the Stephen Law Office in Spokane, Washington. He's been working on fair housing defense law for many, many years in this area. Uh, David Penny. Uh, formerly with Kosho Humphreys, now with Tomlinson Associates, also a veteran of, of many a case uh, involving fair housing issues uh, throughout Idaho. And I'm assuming surrounding states, have you worked in other states besides Idaho, David? Uh, pretty much Idaho. Okay, Idaho focused. Uh, my name is Eric Kingston again, and Christina Carlos is here. So I'm going to go ahead and try to link to this. This was the survey that uh, Christina sent out to folks. And we'll see if it'll pop up for us here. So just to give us kind of a feel for um, what people wanted to focus on. Again, we've got now 104 people in this room, in the Zoom room. And it looks like only 24 answered as of, you know, I think 10, 29 this morning. Um, but it seems like reasonable accommodation with respect to animals. That was the first question. And not surprisingly, that gets a lot of votes. Uh, we've got reasonable accommodations without animals. Uh, next, uh, let's see, the two, two that are kind of in second place, like limited English proficiency and issues surrounding COVID-19 and rentals, uh, not surprisingly. And then families with children and reasonable accommodation or reasonable modification, so a physical change to uh, a unit. Then the webinar topics, these are the... Um, the main topics of the webinars the last last few sessions and folks are really interested in enforcing rules and I don't see it, it looks like we're cut off there um, and tenant screening next and then protecting against discrimination and dealing with discovered discrimination I believe are the the next ones there and developing non-discriminatory uh, policies so that gives you kind of an idea and then as far as um, asking folks for a specific question uh, people said just if enforcing evictions during COVID-19, tenants abusing fair housing law, I'm assuming, and any hot new, new hot topics you're seeing in Idaho. And again, I'm assuming that's related to fair housing. Uh, so that being said, go ahead and stop the share and we will start the clock. So Anybody want to start off? Eric or David? Uh, Eric Kingston? Yep. So when you were talking earlier about uh, people with disabilities and landlords uh, that uh, deem somebody uh, disabled, one of the terms that comes up is regarded as disabled or regarded as being in one of the protected classes. And I hear that quite a bit. I'm just throwing that out there because it's kind of some of the lingo that we hear. And it, I see a growing trend in those type of claims. Uh, I think it's really interesting because that's talking about the subjective 
mindset of the landlord, which is difficult for people to understand or, you know, perceive. And I think that's really calling for a lot of speculation in a lot of situations. But I, I have seen cases where uh, the tenant advocates suggested that uh, my client regarded the uh, tenant, a tenant in question as disabled or a member of a protected class. Just something to kick us off with. Yeah. And David, have you run into that? I haven't really seen an uptick in that. I've often often wondered when it was coming. So um, uh, very well might might see it. But so far, pretty much all I've seen is focused on the person having the disability. Okay. And uh, so I'm not seeing. Let's see. Let's see. We got one. We got a couple chat questions here. Let me go right to that. Okay, here's one from Jessica. It's my understanding that we as property managers are not required to set up our rentals for Idaho housing vouchers if the owners don't want us to. Anybody want to address that? Eric, I know you've got some opinions on that one. Right, so in Washington in the last two years, we've seen a adoption of legislation uh, protecting people on their source of income. And somebody was asking about trends in Idaho. I haven't seen a lot of new trends in Idaho as much as I've seen trends in Washington. And what I talked earlier in one of our presentations about a case out of Yonkers, New York, it's about 15 to 20 years old, but it was a disparate impact case where the, the court looked at a landlord who had refused a voucher tenant and ultimately found liability on a disparate impact theory. Um, I thought the case really should have been found on a disparate treatment. The, uh, the landlord in that case, the landlord's attorney were terrible. It was very obvious that they had some discriminatory animus and, uh, and the, the admissions in the record of the proceeding were absolutely horrible. Uh, just some uh, really bad conduct by the landlord, really bad statements by the landlord and the landlord's counsel. Uh, but the case was ultimately decided that the landlord had discriminated against a voucher tenant based on disparate treatment. And uh, I believe that type of theory is, uh, is available. Our Supreme Court of the United States uh, about three years ago recognized um, uh, disparate impact theory as a theory of recovery, even though the Federal Court of Appeals have been using that theory for 25 years or so. So, you know, it's not a legislative rule. It's something you can still say in Idaho, we don't take vouchers, but uh, I'm here to tell you, it's not necessarily a safe harbor and I don't think it has to be legislatively prescribed to create a potential cause of action if you found a very aggressive litigant and a lawyer willing to take the case. So just something to think about. But kind of going to her particular point and phrasing it for Idaho, there's no requirement in Idaho or precedent for being required to take Section 8 vouchers for a you know, private landlord with uh, conventional housing. Um, and, so, yeah, so that would be known as, per, you know, source of income as a protected class. And Idaho doesn't uh, right. recognize that. Right. I, I think Eric's got some good points there, too. I think, you know, he's right. That it depends on the case and, and who's, um, you know, pursuing a, a case. Well, but the case that he refers to is a case where I believe it was in the state of New York. And New York did have uh, laws that required, uh, um, I don't want to misstate it, whether they required um, uh, people to take vouchers or whether they just barred uh, discrimination based upon source of income. I think uh, like the state of Washington that has that type of state law, Idaho does not. Um, whether there'll be inroads and this is a direction ahead uh, could very well be, but I think the springboard for most of this has been a state recognizing source of income as a protected class. And, and I'll just, uh, this is sort of not necessarily related to fair housing, but related to say a section eight voucher or a housing choice voucher. Um, IHFA administers that program in 34 of 44 Idaho counties. And I've talked to a lot of uh, landlords and, you know, property managers over the years about this. Uh, it's, it really doesn't uh, take away any of the landlord's rights or the property manager's rights. It, it allows you to still, um, you know, 
create a lease and have a, a lease in effect and uh, enforce that lease. Um, it just means that uh, part of the tenant's rent is paid, you know, via an electronic deposit, you know, every every month, and they make up the difference. So, um, but uh, you know, it's it's something that's really uh, helpful for a lot of uh, households right now, uh, particularly when uh, housing costs are so high and folks need that stability. So, just putting yeah. in a plug for the housing choice voucher. Kind of to tie in with. Um... We got uh, Eric's comments about people being regarded uh, as having a disability, that there's protection there. There's also protection for people being associated with someone who has a disability. And there's a question from Tiana. Um, she says, we had barely touched on it last week, uh, but she had a question about guests bringing a, ser a, a service animal or companion animal onto the property when the property has a no pet policy. So this is begin getting into the question of the people being associated with someone perhaps that has uh, a disability. Um, certainly if the resident that uh, is disabled and their visitors are coming and their visitors have a disability and have a companion or, or support animal, then, you know, certainly under that circumstance, I know you have to um, uh, permit it, but you probably have to permit it regardless in that, in that particular setting. Uh, Eric, what are your thoughts? Well, Ken Nagy, counsel for uh, Intermountain Fair Housing Council, straight up told me he'd love to sue somebody for uh, excluding a, a guest with an animal, whether it be a service or assistance animal. And Zoe Olson at, at Intermountain is aggressive enough to give uh, Ken the lead and uh, allow him to do that. So I, I don't want to go there. Uh, what I see frequently are leases and rules that require uh, or provide that if an animal's at the property for any length of time whatsoever, uh, without authorization of the landlord, that a fee is imposed. In Washington State, there's a case called Buchanan versus Kettner. It talks about fees being penalties and, and not allowed in residential leases. So I think the issue generates a lot of concern, a lot of different peripheral uh, sort of collateral damage issues. Uh, when, uh, how are you going to remedy this? And whether there's going to be a fee or some sort of uh, action against the tenant for having somebody bring an animal, and then two, the fair housing consequences, and uh, and the advocates in Idaho out of Boise coming in with the idea that they would uh, believe that's an actionable claim and like to pursue the landlord for it. So it's definitely not ground I want to step on. Well, it creates a lot of enforcement issues and um, and property protection issues certainly uh, for management. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And in fact, it's murky as far as what a manager can actually ask the guest of a resident about that guest's animal. Uh, because if someone is bringing an animal that's a dog onto the property, then it may be covered as a service animal under the ADA. Um, and then we know ADA says there are two questions, you know, is the dog, uh, you know, are you a person with a disability and is the dog trained to, per some, to perform some function? And the, um, you can't ask for written verification that the dog's trained. You can't ask for the dog to perform its, uh, its service for the individual. And if, if you were the owner of a restaurant, if they say yes and yes as to those two questions, the dog's coming in. We don't know really what a manager can do with regard to an apartment complex. I mean, can you require them to uh, go through the written verification um, uh, that we require of a resident or an applicant who is seeking to have a companion animal? And how do you do that with somebody who's coming to visit for the afternoon or maybe just for a day or two and then is then going to be gone. So it really creates a, a tough um, position. I think most people have left it alone 
with the idea that, well, what's the downside of this animal being on the, the property very temporarily for a visitor? Because I'm going to enforce my visitor policy that limits visits to, you know, seven days and not on a reoccurring basis or something like that. So uh, it's really is this and you know the the resident becomes responsible for that animal that's visiting. So if your guest brings their animal and the guest animal is running wild on the property, they aren't cleaning up after the animal it's damaging landscaping, then, or it hurts somebody, then that animal is the responsibility of your resident and the resident is putting their tenancy at risk. You know, they get lease violations and, you know, reoccurring basis, you've probably built a case to take action with regard to the tenant's lease. At a minimum, they'd be responsible for all the costs or of any damages caused by the um, uh, animal. So I think it's, it's really kind of the default position without really good guidance is that you treat that visiting animal and hold the resident responsible as if it was their own. I, I was gonna re reference, I think those are good points by David. I was gonna reference that FHEO 2020-01 that was released on uh, January 28th, 2020. I, I was just looking through the document to see the reference in it. I think it references or has some uh, language in it about guests and animals. I have to look at it again. Um, I, I'm just not jumping out at me. But one of the big things that, about 2020-01 is it talks about the landlord's ability to request verification and verification of disability in particular. And it, and it kind of segues back into what we were talking about before about apparent or regarded disability. And uh, if I were to see a guest that was clearly disabled, uh, an amputee or uh, somebody like that with an animal, then I think that that the uh, FHEO 2020-01 is telling you that um, you have no right to ask for a verification of disability status. And if you see the animal with this person, uh, it's gonna it should be somewhat apparent what the uh, that the animal is an assistance or a service animal of some sort. So I, I think that kind of also factors into this. So uh, if I think David's comments about the animal running wild and crazy, that's those are those are earmarks and facts that would tend to make me more likely to enforce the type of policy. Um, and I think make the policy more legitimate. I think with without those facts, I think it gets to be a much more questionable uh, rule to apply. There was that same person asked a follow-up question on, um, is there anything being done to bridge the gap on landlord rights when it comes to fair housing complaints? As of right now, the burden of proof is on us when there are baseless fair housing complaints. And I hate to disappoint you, the answer is no. Uh, uh, certainly now, and I think it'll be the for the foreseeable future, HUD has to intake all of the complaints that are made, has to investigate them. Um, and I think what you, you've got to determine what can you control and what can you not control. And you can't control that part of it, but you can control how you will have the documentation, the information, the policies and procedures and the compliance necessary to lay that complaint to rest quickly and efficiently without it going much further than the initial intake and investigation. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure Eric preaches this too, and it is document, document, document. Um, you know, whether it's photographs of the animal running wild on your property, whether it's inspection reports, whether it's communications, whether it's tenant complaints, um, you know, whether your response to uh, lease violations, documenting it all is by far the key. I mean, that uh, whether you're responding yourself or you have a lawyer do it, you're only as good as the documents you have. That is your ammunition 
that's your blanket so that you can feel um, uh, protected in that process. So I've got, you know, another one. I mean, not surprisingly, this is always a, a real hot topic, you know, for any training that I've been to. Um, here's one, and I think it's related to some, something Eric referenced earlier. Uh, she has a tenant that, with a support animal that lets the dog defecate on the lawn and back of the unit and refuses to pick it up, even though she is able to. Uh, she's been issued violations for this to no avail. Do we have any recourse on something like this? Uh, she says, I don't feel that we should be responsible for cleanup, and I'm aware that we cannot bill them for cleanup. Uh, and I know that's sort of, if they, you know, it's not reasonable to expect the staff or the, you know, the site staff to clean up after someone's dog. So that's uh, not part of their, part of their deal. Is that correct? Yes. So any suggestions here? Well, I, I think David's exactly right. It's all about the documents. And, and I look at the documents as two purposes. They, they serve the purpose of a sword to help you enforce rights and, and obligations, rights of landlords, obligations of tenants and duties of tenants, and they work as a shield and provide exculpatory evidence for claims made. And in all these cases, you know, when it, I've handled, I think, a couple hundred fair housing cases in the last 30 years, and uh, in every case, uh, and I've had a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of them resolved uh, favorably, in every case it starts off with an allegation of discrimination, and then I believe it's the job of lawyers like myself and David Penny to clarify the facts and say, well, no, it, it might seem like discrimination at first blush, but if you if you were to be aware of all the facts of the case, and in this situation with the dog excrement and failure to remove dog, dog waste from the common areas, uh, this is a person with a disability, this is an appropriate animal, but the, the tenant is failing her duty of care to take care of, of the animal, keep it under control, and to clean up the animal waste and keep the area uh, healthy and you know safe and sanitary to some degree. So those legitimate uh, expectations of, of cleaning up after the animal give the landlord rights. Now your rights are only as good as your documents, like David said. So uh, I want to see uh, photographs of, of animal excrement. I want to see a great track record on calendar of how frequently this animal excrement's observed in these areas. I want to see written complaints from neighboring residents. And, uh, and I want to see evidence that, that substantiates my client's claim that the tenant's failing to remove animal waste, including attributing the animal, the waste to this specific animal and not a lot of other animals. So you, you start with that. I think you start your enforcement process with your comply or vacate notices under 6-303. You, uh, you ultimately get to a point where you're going to give some sort of notice to quit or notice to terminate or non-renewal. And then the tenant may come back and sue you for housing discrimination. And you're going to stand fast and say, no, it's not housing discrimination. It's I'm trying to take care of the property because this person's not doing it. And it has very little to do with disability. You may get a second request for accommodation relative to the uh, animal waste removal. And that's going to have to be dealt with because those kind of accommodation requests can be made at any time in the proceedings. Yeah, I think one of the things for people to be aware of is that in a discrimination claim, the claimant is saying, I have a disability that makes me part of a protected class. Some action was taken against me by the housing provider based upon my protected status. We're talking disability, so I'm just gonna use that as the example, disability. The burden and that, they just have to state it. Then the burden shifts to the landlord to come with a legitimate, valid, non-discriminatory reason for having taken the action they did to basically refute or rebut the claim that it was based upon disability. Then the final step is to win. And the plaintiff, the claimant, has to come back and show that that reason offered by the landlord is not valid. It's not Pretext. legitimate. And so hopefully you can see in that back and forth that where the housing provider prevails is being able to show the legitimacy of what they did. So if this person's not cleaning up after the neighbor complaints, you have notices of lease violation warning the person repeatedly to take care of this. Maybe you even have a 
letters begging them, begging them, please do this or your housing could be at issue. And you have that into their response. You're proving that you have a legitimate, valid reason for moving to terminate or seeking to terminate their housing. And you should prevail. I mean, just on that limited group of uh, facts. So what David's described is called the McDonnell Douglas burden shifting analysis. And the third tier is for the tenant to claim that the landlord's legitimate business justification is merely a pretext. This is a, a, a theory, a burden shifting theory that is once again found in FHEO 202001 from January 28, 2020. Now that, that FHEO 202001 has not been uh, found to be good law yet because even though it was offered, authored by HUD, it hasn't gone through a rules making process correctly yet. So we're back at 20-1301 uh, for the law from HUD on regulating uh, reasonable accommodations. But that burden shifting analysis that David talked about, the McDonnell Douglas burden shifting analysis is a theory in fair housing that's very prevalent. And when we had the first question today about what tools are landlords being given? Well, we haven't been given any new tools, but as David said, the old tools still work. And the old tools are keep good records, document like crazy and have good written policies and apply those policies systematically to everybody across the board in a uniform and non-discriminatory manner. So, so guys, I've got one, one more animal related question. And then we had, we had some other non-animal questions uh, earlier on. I wanna make sure we have time for those. Yeah, um, so this last a good one on familial status we ought to get to. Yeah, exactly. So so let's just kind of wrap up the animal uh, this animal section for now um, with do we have to accept paperwork on an emotional support animal or service animal that they paid for online, not an actual doctor? So and and, and to be to be clear, it doesn't have to be a doctor, it just needs to be a third party professional with knowledge of the person's disability and and is is um affirms that the person's requested accommodation there, there's a nexus between the accommodation that's requested and the person's disability correct right so i mean the uh, but the person has to be in a position to know um the verifier has to be in a position mm -hmm. uh to know they have to and i think this is also in the most recent got recent recent guidance the verifying party has to um, have some knowledge of the person who they're verifying for. So in this, the, the answer I would first give, you know, do you have to accept it or take it? You take everything somebody's going to offer you. I would not draw a line and say, you know, I'm not going to take it. Now, whether it carries the day as a verification is a different issue. And I'm assuming that's what uh, the question is. Then a lot of factors go into play. You know, who is it from? Was it an online therapist psychologist? Or is it just one of those uh, sites where a person fills in blanks and they get a, a flag, a vest, and a badge or something like that? And, and presto changeo. Uh, pets become uh, emotional support animal. Um, so I think that makes a big difference. Uh, typically the response, I think the safest response in either setting is to say, thank you for providing that, but we need something more. You know, kind of this interactive process of trying to discuss it, not throwing up a roadblock, but but trying to seek and obtain more information for a valid uh, verification. Um, you know, I've had seen cases where uh, to get the type of online verification, the person called and spoke with the, um, uh, well, with some psychologist or therapist for like two hours before they found that the person was disabled and needed a uh, comfort animal. Now the person was licensed in Florida, not licensed in Idaho. Um, the visit was, we had other reasons to go into it and, and to seek more information. 
but um, uh, usually I think the best response isn't an out and out denial, but to ask the person, you know, would it be, uh, you know, do you have someone um, who's seen you more recently, who has uh, better knowledge of you, who could provide the verification uh, locally, um, and try and work to some common understanding by offering alternatives that would meet your requirement, as opposed to just saying no. Eric? Uh, the FHEO 2020-01 on page 11 at the top of the document talks about documentation from the internet and it talks about the sham websites. I've seen these, I've seen some of, there's one institution out of D Denver, Colorado. I've seen a fair amount of stuff from. I, I think this is a very slippery slope for landlords for a couple of reasons I'll explain. But the HUD guidance says that under the Fair Housing Act, a housing provider may request reliable documentation when an individual requesting a reasonable accommodation has a disability or disability related need that is not obvious or otherwise known. In HUD's experience, documentation from the internet it is not by itself sufficient, sufficiently reliable to establish an individual has a non-observable disability and a disability related need for an assistance animal. By contrast, a licensed healthcare professional delivering services remotely, including over the internet, uh, may, be, uh, may be able to uh, provide a reasonable accommodation verification. And one uh, source of reliable forms is a documentation from a note or a note from a person's healthcare professional that confirms the disability or the need when the provider has personal knowledge of the individual. And I think what David alluded to is, is very apropos, and that is uh, when you're looking at these cases, you're going to probably be dealing with a psychologist or a psychiatrist in this remote venue. If the tenant making the reasonable accommodation request lives in a rural area where services, healthcare services, aren't really around there or readily available, then I think it tends to make that remote prognosis or diagnosis much more reasonable. If the person has elicited a great deal of information, the healthcare professional has elicited information from this tenant making the request, you can expect that they've padded their own file to protect their own professional license uh, and an ability to do business to make it at least appear that they have some sort of treating relationship. And I've seen some of these sham providers go as far as to talk about the person's history, talk about the person's uh, uh, diagnosis, and then make a prognosis or a recommendation for an animal or anything like that. And I think in those situations, if you were to say, hey, you're a sham provider, I'm not, I'm not buying off on that. Boy, I think you're on a slippery slope because quite frankly, I don't think it's very hard for a professional healthcare provider to say somebody's got anxiety or depression. You wouldn't have to spend five minutes on the phone with me to tell me that I'm, I've got anxiety, all right? I've got super high anxiety. So I know that's readily apparent to people that are dealing with me. And I think it could be easily easy for a professional to make a remote diagnosis and to pad their file with enough information about you and to make some sort of recommendation of future treatment that makes it all look really legitimate, even though they are probably a sham provider that's just do, selling these certificates. So if, if I'm in your shoes as a landlord, boy, I'm looking at these things really hard and, uh, and I'm, I'm always erring on the side of granting accommodations. I'm sure that makes you guys cringe, but I'd much rather uh, err on the side of granting the accommodation deal with the people on the backside than uh, expose you to a big lawsuit. And my experience with Intermountain is uh, they frequently come out with six-figure requests in a lot of their cases. Uh, David, have you seen those type of six-figure requests at the opening of uh, some of the Intermountain cases? Um, over the history I have at times, not real recently, but no. I mean, kind of backed off a little bit from Mabbitt. Uh, mistakes are costly, let's put it that way. I'd agree. So, um, all right, you guys, let's, um, should we move into sort of the animal free zone for a little while sure. and uh, see what comes up? So I want to go back to Taisha's uh, question early on. Um, she says, my question is in regard to domestic violence. Are there protections for victims of domestic violence, specifically the financial and housing consequences of domestic violence? For instance, or for example, if a prospective tenant has multiple evictions due to domestic violence, 
are there protections when applying to units that have automatic denials for past evictions? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> so David. <laughs> no, I mean, there's the Violence Against Women's Act that, uh, uh, but the remedies under that are fairly limited. Um, there's, um, uh, I have not seen a fair housing discrimination case uh, built around uh, domestic violence with domestic violence victims as uh, a protected class. Now, um, one of the reasons the Violent, Violence Against Women's Act, which of course applies to all genders, um, uh, came about was the argument that um, uh, the female gender is more likely or more susceptible to being victims of uh, domestic violence. So could somebody come with a disparate impact case? Uh, you know, perhaps. I haven't seen it yet. But, um, you know, somebody who's knowledgeable about making claims, uh, domestic violence might be what it is on the surface, but if you dig deeper, the question might be a disability. I mean, is, is alcoholism by the person an issue? Um, uh, drug addiction by somebody who's not currently using. You can be, you can have a disability. Um, so, uh, or, you know, bipolar disorder leads to a lot of domestic violence. So um, there are ways that you could find a basis for a claim, but uh, simply to say on its face, domestic violence victims have protected status on that basis, uh, the law isn't there yet. Eric? Well, I, David, I think you actually have a, a slide from one of your own presentations that talks about the uh, zero tolerance for violence policies at some land. Sure. Uh, falling into sex or gender discrimination because of a disparate impact analysis. I thought that's kind of what you were going to segue in, but you, uh, I believe that is a, a good, uh, a good um, issue to be sensitive to because if you were to apply your zero tolerance for domestic violence uh, in the application process and this person were to uh, substantiate that, hey, I've been a victim of these uh, crimes or these calls, uh, then I think you're going to be in a lot of hot water, uh, potentially not only with VAWA, like David said, that doesn't have great remedies for it, might protect them from an eviction process, but also I think uh, the, the collateral claim would be a fair housing claim based on some sort of disparate impact on how you applied your, um, your crime-free or zero-tolerance policy on domestic violence. And I can tell you that a lot of police reports and, uh, and radio catalogs, that type of thing, They'll catalog a, a, a law enforcement visit to a property as a DV call and not tell you who the perpetrator or who the, who the victim is. And uh, I, I just think it's, uh, once again, a little bit of a slippery slope. Uh, in everything we do, guys, uh, you can't just say, hey, it's this, so it's got to be this. There's a little bit of forethought and a little bit of investigation and due diligence that comes along with uh, evaluating almost all the facts that come in on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you got to make sure you got your facts right and know what you're doing. And I, I usually get uh, pretty excited when I see arrests for assault and that type of thing, but I'm always looking to see who's the victim and is the victim a household member because that's going to really curtail the scope of the action I take. And I am always carving victims out of my relief. I'm making sure that my relief does not include the victim. And, and I can tell you, it's a real big problem in DV because all the, the theories on that is that there's this recurring cycle of and pattern, and it's not uncommon for the victim to have the perpetrator come back over. And uh, it's really difficult to affect, determine a lot of times whether the, the perpetrator's invited in or returning uh, by their own uh, will or force against the will of the victim. And how much is the victim facilitating this? So these uh, DV cases get really, really tough when the victim and the perpetrator continue to have relations after there's been violent activity and you want to uh, bring the victim into it. It's, uh, David made a comment about you know multiple compliance notices and, and building the case up. And if anybody's ever worked with me, 
I, I build cases all the time. It's rare that I take knee jerk reactions unless the facts are really clear. And uh, I do have no problem taking knee jerk reactions to remove the perpetrator when the facts are clear and there's an arrest for an assault or a violent crime. But got to do a little due diligence here, guys. So, and I think it's also important to remember that, you know, for domestic violence in a lot of cases, I mean, it's, it's an issue of control, exerting psychological control over someone. And, and so, you know, when you, you might say, well, why does this person let the, you know, the abuser come back? It's complicated, like you guys talked about. Um, so a lot of interesting things to consider there. Um, but I guess it, it goes back to, you know, your, the sort of safe option is, we consider all requests for accommodation or we consider, you know, all of these uh, things and we're going to take, you know, we're going to take a look at this and get back to you. It, you know, just as opposed to a snap decision, be thoughtful about it and, uh, and get, and understand the facts first and then find a really good attorney if you don't have one. <laughs> so um, let's see, here's one uh, in our, if our section eight property has a policy that complaints must be in writing, dated, signed, and then the date, time, and descriptions of the incident, would an email suffice? I've been told it must have an original signature. I have a tenant that says an email is all she needs to submit. It well, does not indicate whether the um, tenant has a law degree or not, but. Well, I guess my short answer is follow the policy set by your um, um, uh, you know, the management company that you work for or the owner that you uh, work for. Um, I mean, those are reasonable policies. If the person who just wants to submit the um, email says that they can't come down there and sign because they're got a disability, for example, you may have to accommodate them by accepting simply an email. Uh, the other hand though, if you ignore an email complaint, you might do so at your own peril because that doesn't mean it's not legitimate or it's not something that you should hop to as, uh, as the manager and, and start your file building, your documentation, your information gathering that we've discussed. So, um, you know, I, I don't know that you've, need to draw, a, uh, I guess I wouldn't draw a firm line. I'd have the policy, I'd try and follow it. I'd, I'd tell people that, but if uh, one comes by email, I wouldn't ignore it either. Okay, um, got another question here. Dave, uh, can I address oh, that? Yeah, please. So, so I think that's a, a decent internal policy in theory, and I always want tenant complaints in writing. I think, it, I think that really helps landlords. At the same time, I think a landlord has an implied warranty of habitability and has a duty to keep the premises safe and to, to ensure everybody's uh, following the duties and rules. And I think if you're on notice that, uh, that there's a defective condition or a problem in your property, uh, depending on the severity of that condition, there could be liability ramifications if you fail to act. I think the internal policy is a little bit rigid I like David's ideas of, uh, of trying to champion the policy as much as you can, but at the same time, uh, taking the information in, considering the information, investigating the information, asking for the, the system to be followed the way it's supposed to be followed, but I wouldn't necessarily make that a hard line in the sand because I think it could have some severe repercussions, liability repercussions for the landlord. Um, I also tell all my clients to really, really go to great lengths with tenants that are complaining, to plead with them to put their information in writing, to, to give the provide all the details, to tell the tenant that you're only able to, to champion the causes that they can support and and uh, and back. You know, quite frankly, if a if a tenant's not willing to put a a complaint in writing or go to court to testify about that conduct or that condition. The landlord may be without the evidence to prove the issue. And uh, I do a lot, a lot, a lot of conduct evictions. Uh, and they're all about the evidence. They're all about the testimony. And uh, the best testimony and the best evidence comes from the neighboring residents, not from the manager, not from the staff. It comes from objective, 
uh, third parties and neighboring residents that convince the court that there's something legitimate here and uh, that is compromising their, their living. So um, I think it sounds like a great policy in theory. I'd love to see it followed uniformly by everybody. It'd make my life a heck of a lot easier with having written complaints. I definitely want my clients to, to record what's being told to them over, even over on the telephone. Uh, and there, and write down what's gone on, who told them what, where, and how, and and then follow up on it as as they can. Always ask for the writing, but I, I think it's uh, too rigid of a policy to enforce black letter. And I think that you uh, you should uh, be soft in its approach. And and again, just a kind of a reminder that in in the question, it doesn't indicate whether the complaint has to do with a you know a defect in the property or a maintenance issue or a tenant you know a tenant complaint tenant on tenant complaint so uh like but i think you guys kind of addressed that in general uh in your responses so um back to this familial status uh question does the protected class familial status include extended family members or are there limits who might be included so could it be like cousins or uncles or aunts or you know grandparents things like that uh, for instance, would occasional visits to a home by some young nieces and nephews qualify a household for familial status protection? Aha. And exemptions to HOA restrictions against fences that an owner would want for the protection of these children. Okay, that's a that's a fairly complicated complicated uh, situation. So yeah, there's a lot of layers to that. <laughs> it's a hard question. Yeah. And and I think that those uh, occupancy cases, or I think familial status can get into occupancy. I think can get into uh, ethnicity. Uh, a lot of cultures kind of have different ideas about uh, cohabitating and, and congregating together and stuff. Um, I think it's it's going to be really really factually driven uh, in the situ in the assessment of what's going on. Um, I, I don't think that familial status is necessarily rigid on dependent children. Uh, but I, what do you think, David? I, I think uh, that the occasional visit by a niece or nephews is not going to be a familial status issue um, because there is some guidance on, you know, uh, what you include. You include, for example, adopted children. You include children that are in the process of being adopted. You... Um, some of that who you include language, I think uh, implicitly kind of draws the line on who would not be counted. So I think it really is the household that occupies um, uh, that dwelling, because remember that's how it, I mean, if, if it's grandma and grandpa living there, they don't have a minor child who's a member of that household. If they adopt their grandchildren or obtain a custody order, temporary or otherwise, of their children so that they're residing in it, then familial status comes into play. So I think the occasional visitor, because it's not discussed about including, is excluded. And that that wouldn't, um, uh, wouldn't come into, would not come into play. I agree with that. Yeah, and I guess you know it comes down to what you know. How is that house? How is household defined? You know, in the lease terms. So, okay, uh, let's see. We got some other questions here. Um, one is uh, cap on application fees has to do with that. As a result of the cap on application fees, I'm seeing more and more properties instead charging two to three hundred dollar non refundable administration fees. Mm -hmm. Is this a violation of the application cap or more of an unfortunate consequence? And I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the application, uh, the cap that she's referring to. It must be in the city of Boise. Um, I think that's where, uh, Okay. Uh, that's the only cap I'm aware of uh, in Idaho okay, yeah, I, this I, time. I, There's a lot that of, makes sense. Uh, you know, the municipalities versus the Idaho legislature on who's gonna control uh, these types of issues. I guess to keep it simple, because you know this is a very narrow area, is anything that's a subterfuge, that's a dodge or a diversion or a way right. to get around a, 
um, you know, an elephant by calling it a zebra doesn't work and is yeah. a bad idea. And, uh, and it's an interesting, the, the numbers she cites here, um, you know, two to 300 bucks seems like kind of out of scale with most application fees anyway. So, and that may be just a kind of an extreme example, but. Yeah, uh, that's so. bad planning. Well, All right, and uh, so, hey, go ahead. Eric, can I Eric. address this? So, so I, I'm seeing a lot more uh, non-refundable administrative fees. I don't really have a problem with them. I don't think that in it, the ones that I see aren't necessarily driven by application fee limits as much as uh, repercussions on damage, uh, damage deposit withholdings. I'm seeing uh, in, in at least Washington state, there is a lot, lot of litigation on the landlord's failure to timely return a deposit disposition letter and mm. deposit refund. And I see a lot of landlords that are trying to go away from heavily regulated deposit uh, accounts to non-refundable fees as an effort to uh, collateralize their relationship, make sure they've got some security on it, and to make sure they're not left holding the bag uh, because they can't take adequate deposits anymore or they think that deposits are not a safe harbor because there's so much litigation on the deposits. So, um, you know, I, I think it's kind of a leap to say that this, this, this enhanced or increased amount of uh, people taking non-refundable administrative fees is all related to screening fees. I think that, that it's related to a lot of issues, including uh, demands and costs for keeping properties up and including uh, potential litigation on deposit withholding. Uh, I don't know, I don't think it's as active in Idaho as it is in Washington, but uh, I know that there's a real problem with landlords left holding the bag and having a lot of tenants that vacate, leaving extraordinary wear and tear damages that are ultimately not uh, collected from the tenant. Okay. And also, I just want to have, I've got a follow up to the question about um, complaints filed either in writing or by email. And it says the tenant sent me an order by the Supreme Court of Idaho that changes the Idaho rules for electronic filings and filing and service. The complaint has to do with the tenant on tenant complaint. So that was, in fact, the focus of that tenant complaint question. Is that uh, the rules of Idaho on electronic service relate to uh, tenants providing complaints to landlords. That's that those rules in Idaho are probably related to electronic service of the legal documents, and a, uh, a, a resident complaint is not a legal document. Yeah, that's okay. Idea. All right, good to, good to know. All right, um, so NCHM, and I'm not sure who that is. I'm sorry teaches that you cannot charge over the actual amount it costs to run reports during their fair housing course. I don't know. Does anybody have any idea what that means? So I, you're not supposed to be using your tenant screen as a profit source is what that's all about. And that I think that's fairly legitimate. I think it has to, I don't know that it has to be the exact correlation to what's being charged, but I think it certainly has to be a reasonable correlation to what's being charged. And I think that would come in a probably a consumer protection action is, is where I would think that would get some traction. Don't you think David? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in some subsidized programs, you can't charge anything for an application fee and I think that might be RD, although someone can correct me if that's wrong. And then HUD, HUD based properties, it's limited to a relatively small amount. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I think a rule of thumb is that whatever you charge, one, if you're in the city of Boise, there's a cap on it, you got to comply with that and trying to end run it by calling it something else is, is risky business. The second thing is even beyond that, you need to have a fairly good correlation between your actual cost and what you're charging. Uh, you go beyond that, I think you're always asking for trouble. And you know, unless we had something extremely specific, it'd be hard to really discuss it more, but. Okay, uh, let's see, we'll go to another one here. Um, oh, David, just some 
fan mail here. Um, <laughs> you've always been our attorney for evictions. Now that you work for Tomlinson, are you no longer taking clients outside of Tomlinson? I think I know the sad answer to that. Yeah. Um, so fan, fan mail for David. And uh, the good news the good news is Eric's available. So. Yeah, Eric's available and, and he's good. If you're talking about, uh, if you say, well, you know, he's in Spokane and, and I want somebody who's tangible in Boise. Uh, there's always um, Matt Shellstraight at the Kosho Humphrey Law Firm that I left. And so Matt yeah. at Kosho Humphrey, if you want somebody tangible to, you know, here in Boise, the Boise, South Idaho area, otherwise Eric Stevens, your go-to guy. And, and as, as folks have other um, recommendations for that, um, let me know. Um, you can put them in the chat if you want. Um, I do maintain the fairhousingforum.org site, and we do have a, a page there, uh, resources and links. And there is, um, you know, a heading that says, I think it's civil, civil rights defense attorneys or something like that. So I've got some links to different folks that have worked in Idaho. Uh, Eric's in, in that one, too, and Kosher Humphreys is in that. So. Um, I'm surprised how few and far there actually are as far as yeah. attorneys knowledgeable and, and um, uh, you know, just housing law, whether it's fair housing or beyond that, uh, the various laws that apply. Uh, right. And stay up on it. Right before our, our uh, conference today, I happened to be reading the Idaho Advocate, which is the bar uh, magazine. And, you know, there was absolutely zero reference housing law, fair housing, uh, lawyers practicing in that area. And I'm, I'm really surprised. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I am going to Boise and, uh, and going to practice there. Uh, I am looking for affordable housing clients and subsidized housing clients in Boise uh, and fair housing cases. Uh, so that, that is what I'll be doing in that area. Uh, I think it's a fairly quick and cheap plane flight uh, from Spokane to, to Boise. I already practice in every county east of the Cascades, and I did the math and figured out it'd be a heck of a lot cheaper for me to go do a case in Boise than it would Ellensburg, Washington. So um, we will be coming over there, and I do welcome uh, referrals and uh, new clients in the affordable housing context. I also heard that he'll give a new set of steak knives for every client who sends him a new case. <laughs> not yeah well, that's good news TV, i tell right? you that for everybody out there that is really good news uh oh geez you guys that is good news for everybody so um here's a here's a new one i hate to shift gears from the steak knives but um because everybody likes free steak knives um this one has to do with you eric it says eric last week you talked about having a specific set of criteria you go through when picking a tenant uh, and making it available so nobody can accuse you of discriminating. Well, I think that's a stretch, but um, do you have an example of the criteria we are legally allowed to use as far as past evictions, et cetera? Sure. Well, I think your uh, screen criteria should uh, tell tenant applicants what's going to result in acceptance or denial of their application. I would expect it to look at their credit history, their past rental history, and their criminal conviction history subject to uh, the HUD guidance on uh, criminal conviction screening from April 4th, 2016. And I think all those uh, components should be uh, in writing. They should tell the tenant uh, how far back you're going to look. You're, you're limited in time by the Fair Credit Reporting Act going back generally seven years predating the tenant screening report in most situations. And uh, once again, this is one of your exculpatory documents because when you deny somebody based on this objective criteria in your screening report, and they say, no, you discriminated against me. You get to come back and say, no, I didn't discriminate against you. You have two bankruptcy filings in the last seven years, including a discharge. You have a negative re reference from your past landlord. And in fact, an eviction from your past landlord. And then I see you were convicted of uh, residential burglary two years ago. So you fail all my objective criteria. And this has zero to do with your protected class status. Now, we rarely get a case that's that big of a softball pitch where we get to hit it out of the park like that. 
But the reality is, if you're if you're applying your objective criteria systematically and uniformly, and then making reasonable accommodations uh, for people with disabilities that are verified, you should be pretty good on your uh, tenant screening. And I think the next thing is just you know how far back in time are you looking at these at these issues and and understand and appreciate that you're limited in the scope. I think that answers it. I don't have anything to. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So um, this one kind of uh, we addressed this in a session at I, IHFA's uh, housing and economic development conference last year. Uh, interestingly. Uh, what do you do when you have a resident who you discovered is a hoarder? Uh, we have issued a lease violation, given her plenty of time to clean the apartment. There hasn't been much of, much of a change. Uh, to complicate things, uh, she has other issues, mental Ill illness issues. Uh, do we have any recourse or what are we allowed to do? Her lease is coming up so I can choose not to renew. But my concern is that we're, with the um, disability issues, wouldn't that be possibly a fair housing issue? Any guidance you can provide would be so, so appreciated. So, Again, not specific legal advice, uh, but just in general terms, you know, what are some thoughts there? The first thought, and I think we all have to just get used to this, is hoarding is now a well-recognized disability. So I think our terminology needs to change. To say that I've got a tenant who's a hoarder, or to put that in writing, Never. Is you're, you're doing a great disservice to yourself, the owner, the management company, everybody. Hoarding is a disability. I mean, we're not going to write and say, I have somebody confined to a wheelchair. I've got to get them out because they run over the daisies in the, you know, the landscaping or something like that. You can't write, I've got somebody who's a hoarder. And, um, and so I've got to get rid of them as a, as a tenant. So we've got to turn back good 10, 15, 20 years of using that terminology. What you have is a person who is violating the lease by causing damage and failure to do the housekeeping requirements that are required under the lease. That's what you've got. That's what we have to focus on. And on that basis, you can proceed to enforce your lease. So the person has a disability. People with disabilities still have to comply with their lease. The issue comes up if they then make a request for accommodation. So what happens is you go and do an inspection. The place is full of stuff, floor to ceiling. You can't walk around, no ingress, no egress, no ability to clean. And so what do you do? You take pictures of the violation. You complete an inspection report. You then do a notice of lease violation to that resident saying we're coming back in three days to inspect for these violations. You come back in three days. Nothing's changed. It's the same way. You do the same process. And I think you give even another violation and another opportunity, kind of under the three strikes basis. They don't do anything, then you've got grounds for an eviction. But let's say between the second and the third one, you get a request for accommodation. I'm disabled and I can't clean my apartment. So what do you do in that situation? Well, there are a couple of responses to that. One, and I think it's a little too blunt in most cases, is to, um, you know, they'd have to give you verification unless it's obvious, give, you know, verification of it. But that request is unreasonable. The request that I need to have a dirty apartment that has no ingress and egress, that I can't clean, that's susceptible of pest infestation, that's a fire hazard in the event of a fire, is a unreasonable request. Now the request may be, I need more time. I haven't been able to get an agency to come in and help me clean. It's a different request. 
that would be one that I believe the prudent management company should respond with, well, how long do you need? Or, you know, what the arrangements are. If there's a disagreement over whether something is safe from a fire standard or not, a lot of local fire departments will come and get do an inspection and will tell you, are the bo are boxes stacked too high? Is the, is the uh, passageway too narrow? And that gives you something very strong. You, you virtually, I mean, I can't never say never, right? But you almost never have to grant a request that makes the building unsafe for the occupants or the other people. So, you know, I'll let Eric jump on it from there, but that, that would be the way I would hope uh, it would be handled. I think, I think David's spot on. I think uh, this explains why his clients are gonna miss him. Uh, he's talked exactly like how I build these cases up. And the beautiful thing about what David said is how he opened up with change the rhetoric and change the terminology and uh, do not use terms and phrases like hoarder. Uh, it, quite frankly, it, it, it's on the borderline of being offensive, I think in some ways. Uh, it's all about cleaning and maintaining the property and all of David's concerns are just spot on. And I like the process that he was, uh, he was discussing. It's exactly how I handle these things. And, I, and it's illustrative of how we build these cases up. And we work towards compliance because what I tell the client on my side is, hey, if we can get them to rectify the condition and not live like that and abate the nuisance, abate the waste, then uh, we're gonna have a lot better situation for everybody, including the tenant. And I've had a lot of tough cases like this over the years. And I've had a lot, a lot of success. Now, I got to tell you, I was, I was in a, a seminar with, or watching a seminar from uh, Idaho Legal Aid a couple of months ago, about six, eight months ago. And one of the advocates from Idaho Legal Aid said um, she didn't know what waste was. And she had never seen a waste case. And when I plead these things, I plead these as nuisance and waste activity. And a, and a waste is a ameliorative or a consequence, a defect in the premises that's going to, to damage the premises potentially permanently and stuff. So a, a lot of these conditions like David talked about, the, you, you strike on issues like infect, exacerbating or, or causing infestation, uh, blocking ingress and egress um, uh, for fire safety purposes, uh, compromising the, sa the systems in the property, getting stuff, personal property too close to heating systems, water, uh, water heaters, that type of thing, and then uh, damaging stuff. I want to I want to segue into another hypothetical too, because I, one of the things David talked about was the need to take photographs, and I want my clients to photograph at every entry into the property. The other day, I had a case where a uh, a tenant much like this, mental health disability issues, uh, is really struggling to live alone. And she was flushing uh, cat litter down the toilet as well as feminine products. And she's got a pretty aggressive family advocate going for her. And uh, the client showed me some pictures of the cat litter in the bathroom and told me that they had uh, just removed a bunch of cat litter and feminine products from the toilet and my question to them was, where's the photograph of all the, the foreign debris and foreign matter removed from the toilet? And they said, oh, we didn't take any photos of that. And the first thing we, we sent that message to the advocate of this tenant. And the first thing the advocate said was, what makes you think that, that our client, the tenant, flushed this stuff down the toilet in the apartment that she lives in alone and has for the last month and a half uh, and was unoccupied beforehand. What makes you think she's the one who did it? And we got pictures of a bathroom with cat litter all over the floor and a cat litter box under the sink, but we're still being challenged on the damages and, and the proof of the, of the causation. And I'm sitting here going, it's all about your evidence. And David made the comment about having photographs of these conditions. And when you issue these complier vacate notices, I don't want you to photograph the condition before you issue the notice. I want you to photograph the condition when you come back in. And it's all about the evidence. And, and that, if you, that's what you got to get out of these things. Uh, you have, if the right of entry through consent or through notice, 
you should be able to preserve conditions within plain view, not conditions that are not within plain view. You can't open up closets and doors and stuff like that, but anything in plain view, as long as you have a right of entry, there should not be an expectation of privacy, is my opinion. Okay, thank you guys. So and, here's another question. There was, Go ahead. there was one question trying to extrapolate this to the, the issue created by the accumulation and the unclean condition was causing pest problems as opposed to uh, uh, fire uh, ingress, egress issues. And I don't think that it would change the analysis if this is, um, I mean, if, if, if you have an extermination program for a building and due to the stuff in the apartment, your exterminator cannot treat that apartment, then it's the same as a, it might not be quite as bad as a fire violation, but you do the same process we've discussed. You document it, you give warnings, you do your best to get them to comply so you can treat the apartment. Then if you can't, they're you know subject to termination. They're interfering with your management. Yeah. And also just to um, you know back to the uh, conference session we had on hoarding, it was more we had an MSW come in to kind of help people understand you know what's going on you know with the hoarding uh, condition and you know just to understand that a little bit better. Um, okay, another question here. In one of the other trainings, it was mentioned that we do not have to rent to prospective tenants if they're belligerent during the application process. Is are there protections against belligerent tenants? who are on an active lease. So the example is I have a tenant who, uh, anytime I have to speak with them, whether a message is directly to them or sent complex wide, calls to yell and curse. Other than acting in this way towards me, they follow the rules and pay their rent on time. This is a conduct issue that is really, really driven and controlled by the strength and scope of your lease covenants and rules, in my opinion. You need to go to great lengths to uh, build language into your lease and rules that protects your managerial staff from harassment. And I, and I, I think the, the devil's in the detail here, folks. Uh, real broad covenants and rule and language in the rules that talks about what type of conduct won't be tolerated. And then when you have a complaint, you've got to be really, really specific about what's being said uh, to your managerial staff or what's being done to your managerial staff. I don't think it's enough to say they were rude, vulgar, and belligerent. I want them to say that they referred to my manager, Adam, as X, Y, and Z. And I like my clients to use verbatim quotes of the nasty rhetoric that's thrown at them and the nasty language that's hurled at them because I can motivate a judge a lot of times if I can put words in somebody's mouth that is patently offensive, threatening, or hostile, and, and can be perceived like that. But it's really all about the scope of your rules. And the Landlord Tenant Act, there isn't really one in Idaho. We don't have a whole lot of statutory protection against that type of conduct. It really fits into nuisance activity, which is an unreasonable use of harm that would offend an ordinary person's senses. But at the same time, I think it's driven by your lease covenants and your rules and the strength thereof. David? Yeah, and again, it comes back to case building. Um, you know, if somebody calls, you know, you record them. Or if you're going to give a notice of lease violation, um, you know, that notice says on such and such a date, you called the office and spoke to me. And in the course of that, you called me this, 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 and this. You know, this is a violation of section five of your lease that prohibits you from uh, threat, you know, engaging in conduct that is threatening and intimidating and harassing of management or other residents, something like that. Yeah. And I, and David, would you agree with me that if your lease and rules are silent on that type of conduct, it's going to be a lot tougher to enforce that type of conduct and prohibit it? Yeah, absolutely. Unless you have one of the subsidized properties where that has that concept of other good cause. They kind of, uh, which of course is a is a different animal, um, but it kind of falls into that. It's not addressed in the lease or handbook, but you sure as heck shouldn't live in an apartment complex if you do it type of category. But generally, you're right, and you're always going to be. 
I mean, I can't imagine having a lease and a handbook that do not address aggressive conduct and and make it a lease violation. I, I, mean, I see. Just, I see the I see the protective language in rules much more than leases, and I and I deal with the HUD subsidized model lease all the time. I don't think it gets you there. I don't think it's bolstered enough. Uh, I think this is a, a, a topic that really needs to be bolstered and supported by your rule development, and uh, and that's where you're usually going to find these really good protections on conduct. All right. Thanks. We have, uh, we have some additional kind of follow-up on the hoarding uh, question, I believe. Uh, Tammy suggests that the fire department can help out with tenants who, with cleaning challenges, that they can come and teach tenants about safe extraction in the event of a fire, gas leak, or other emergency, maybe to kind of connect the dots for the tenant on why it's important. Health and welfare can help out too. Uh, that's, those are some helpful suggestions. Uh, and then what are your thoughts if the excess accumulation of belongings in the unit besides egress uh, are create, let's see, are creating pest issues that make the place unsanitary? I think you kind of, you might've addressed this as well. Yeah, so, that's the one I was trying yeah. to address. And that's, and that's one, you know, my dad has had that issue in Salt Lake and a couple of the rentals that he's got. Um, and then can we take pictures without tenant's permission? How do we prove it's the actual tenant's unit? And then, you know, there's some question back and forth on that as far as issues with photographing tenants personal property. Uh, you know, when doing semi annual inspections, we're told we can't do that. So thoughts on those those kind of issues. Well, I, I agree with Eric's analysis that as long as it's well within the scope of your work that you're doing uh, and you've got, um, you know, correct either permission or by notice, you have a right to be in the apartment and you see a violation of your lease, uh, you have a right to document it. And documenting it would include taking a picture of it. Yeah. I think it goes to all, all goes to expectation of privacy. And I've, I've seen criminal cases where uh, the co-tenant lets a law enforcement officer into the apartment and then uh, contraband is seized. And uh, the one tenant says, oh, you didn't have a right. And then the, the courts have decided, no, the co-tenant let them in. They were allowed to see whatever was in plain view and they were allowed in and you didn't have an expectation of privacy for that. So. Yeah. I've got an interesting one that, uh, you know, we're kind of talking about this privacy and going in and finding things, but it's the, um, and I haven't seen a question on it yet, but it's the manager smells marijuana smoke. You know, that, that happens a lot. And in the state of Idaho, marijuana use for any purpose is not legal. Um, and so I'll get a lot of, uh, or at times we'll get questions of, you know, what can we do? Or I think we need to evict this tenant. Uh, you know, I smell marijuana smoke. And I think, um, you can give a notice of lease violation based upon a manager smelling marijuana smoke. That, that you know, anybody of uh, an adult today knows pretty much what it smells like. Um, so you can have a reasonable belief and issue a, a notice of lease violation. But if you're going to issue a termination notice, that's going to have to hold up in court, the manager smelling the smoke is not going to be sufficient unless the manager can be established as a uh, professional or an expert in the, uh, in the smell of marijuana smoke. And most managers don't wanna be quizzed about that unless they have a law enforcement background. So, um, uh, just so people know, smelling it may be a reason for you to warn the uh, resident and try to get the resident to curtail their conduct, but it's not going to support an eviction because when you get to court and uh, you know there's nobody with expertise in smelling marijuana smoke and identifying it as marijuana smoke, um, proof is probably going to fail and you're not going to be successful. 
So, so uh, I agree with David, and uh, we call them uh, DREES, D-R-E, Drug Recognition Experts, and uh, when I deal with them. And uh, I can tell you that uh, I've had a lot of drug evictions that I've done in the past. I had one case years ago where I called two U.S. Marshals uh, to the stand that had uh, seized uh, about a quarter ounce of marijuana from a grandson of a uh, tenant in a affordable housing complex. The tenant was Native American, filed a fair housing complaint, alleged she was smudging sage and that the, uh, the, the officers were confused that it wasn't marijuana, that it was her sage that they had received, they had uh, taken from the grandson with his drug paraphernalia. When, I was, when I'm interviewing the two U.S. Marshals in the hallway, one of them tells me, I couldn't tell you what marijuana smells like. I don't really know. Sorry. And, uh, and then I talked to the other guy and he says, oh, yeah, it was marijuana. And I, I got rid of it. Uh, didn't keep any evidence. Didn't record any evidence. Didn't photograph any evidence. Just got rid of it and disposed of it. Uh, I was able to win that case on the totality of circumstances and on some peripheral issues. One of the worst drug cases that I ever saw though, and I was cringing through the whole proceeding going, I could lose this thing uh, because it was mishandled so bad. And, uh, and I think that David's points are well taken. It's all about the evidence. And in this situation, the hypothetical Dave gives you with the smell of marijuana coming out the door, well, I can tell you the tenant's gonna tell you that it wasn't them it's from the neighbor or somebody else. And I think you have very little evidence that they're the exact express cause. And, uh, you know, I really like to see arrest and seizure of drugs in my drug cases to make them bulletproof. Um, and if I don't have that, I'm usually trying to build up additional basis for removal of the tenant because the smell of marijuana alone isn't going to carry the day a lot, even in the affordable housing context where it is patently uh, illegal under the Federal Uniform Controlled Substances Act. So um, it's, it's all these cases, all about the proof. It's all about the evidence and the devils in the detail and, and how substantial your proof is. But if you just smell the smoke and you believe it is, you can still take action outside the courtroom to try and, and address their conduct. Um, so there is at least- Just to say they don't smoke and that they smell it all the time, you're getting closer to having a viable case, but it, it, it's really gonna be how good is your evidence? How, sure. how well can you exclude all the other potential contributing sources to that odor, you know? Uh, how are you gonna really pin these facts on this specific tenant is gonna come to it. And that's gonna be the, the end of the day. And like I said before, and I think David would agree, your best evidence comes from neighboring residents, not the management staff, not the manager. Um, that you're always gonna have a judicial perception of some bias from the landlord staff, I believe. And you're, and you're gonna get rid of that bias uh, predisposition by having neighbors come forward that are gonna be presumed uh, unbiased until it's proven otherwise. And the case is different if it's a matter of violating a no smoking policy, um, whether it's marijuana smoke or tobacco smoke, it doesn't matter. Um, smelling smoke is, is uh, within uh, the knowledge of people who are not experts. So you can, you can usually, uh, if you have a no smoking policy and people are smoking within their units, a manager um, you know, getting hit at the door by a waff of smoke uh, can testify to that um, as a violation. It's just that illegal substance part of a drug uh, eviction that requires a, an expert. So. And, and I think David's comments are, are similar to what I'm saying, which is just it's a lower threshold of proof if it's a no smoking property. So yeah. you're not gonna have to prove drug activity, you're just gonna have to prove smoke. So the uh, the smoke emanating from the unit is gonna be easier to prove. And, and my guess is David and I have both seen vigorous cross-examination of witnesses on drug activity. Uh, cases because I've seen people torn up on the stand and I've had a lot of hard arguments with advocates over proving drug cases. So um, 
you know, I guess one of the, uh, I, I would finish the, this, uh, this issue with, uh, I see a lot of tenant advocates defend criminal activity a lot harder than I would expect it to be defended. Just because somebody's engaged in conduct that's nefarious or criminal doesn't mean they're not going to deny it or, or uh, argue they didn't engage in it when push comes to shove and you're trying to get them out of a housing unit. Okay. And let's see, we've got some other ones. Have you guys addressed the non-smoking property? Um, it says, more often than not, if I suspect drugs are being used, I can go to courts or I courts and see a recent case where the individuals have been convicted of, of a parent familia charge. I use that to prove to the resident that I know they are smoking in the unit. They usually don't fight me after that. Uh, David, what's your thoughts on character evidence? On character evidence? I don't rely <laughs> upon it. <laughs> I like something. Uh, I, like I think it would. I would think a good tenant advocate would uh, would really work hard to try to exclude that criminal activity that didn't occur at the leasehold from being interjected to prove the case that the tenant is engaging in drug activity at the lease. Uh, whether you get it in or not sort of remains to be seen. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it can be her comment. It could be part of a discussion with the tenant about their tenancy uh, but, you know, uh, finding a charge on I-Court and that establishing that the person is using drugs in the unit, there's a jump in there or a leap in there that I don't know that court's going to follow. Um, if it helps in having the discussion with the tenant that, you know, well, let's really talk about this because, you know, this kind of validates my concern, then I think that's okay. Okay, and and she does uh, specify that she just she's not using that in court, so just yeah. kind of a conversation with the tenant. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, you know I wanted to throw this uh, another link in there. Now everybody I think has knows about um, fairhousingforum.org, and they know that they can also go to idahohousing.com forward slash fair hyphen housing. I've got that in the presentation. Um, I'm also going to put in a link to um, Intermountain Fair Housing Council's website in the in the chat because I think um, it's worth worth it for providers and other folks to actually go in there and they have a lot of resources uh, on that page, including some you know limited English proficiency kind of uh, information and um, there's a lot of useful stuff there to educate yourself about you know what what are tenants looking at, what are advocates looking at, and you know they have. Um, links to lots of uh, resources in there. So I wouldn't uh, hesitate to, uh, you know, kind of check what, check that out too. Um, so let's take a look here in the chat. See if we've got anything that we haven't addressed yet. Um, this is great. I, I appreciate all the engagement folks have here. Um, let me see. You know, and you just interrupt me, Eric, if you find something that you want to. Okay, go ahead. Out. You go ahead. But, um, you know, kind of going all the way back to the beginning, we were talking about gender or sex is usually the way it's described as uh, protected class. And we talked about sexual orientation and, and uh, gender identity. And, um, you know, if I see a trend or, or where something's going, um, in the law, that's certainly um, uh, the protection there. And, and Eric referred to the case name. Uh, there was a case that uh, it arises under employment law, but here again, it's, it's an anti-discrimination statute and the US Supreme Court in a 6-3 decision held that the term sex include someone's sexual orientation and gender identity as well. And so prevention against or prohibition against discrimination on that basis. There is not a hard and fast case translating that to housing law, but just about well, most lawyers anyway, I think, and most judges would see that 
you have to interpret the housing law definition and scope of the word sex or gender the exact same way. There's no basis for a different interpretation um, or a reason why you would draw um, a distinction. Um, and then I'd also mention in Idaho, you already have municipalities, there are six or seven of them, the larger cities in Idaho, that actually already have criminal statutes that makes it a crime to discriminate based upon sexual orientation or gender identity. So while the state of Idaho's um, housing, um, you know, many Fair Housing Act uh, doesn't uh, extend to uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. There's every reason to believe the federal law is going that way. And the Federal Fair Housing Act applies in Idaho, regardless of what the legislature says. And then you've got to realize that there are municipalities already in Idaho where the municipality has a criminal statute. They make it a misdemeanor to discriminate based upon sexual orientation or gender identity. So that's probably a trend. So I, I just want to throw something out. I mean, I think Eric touched on this early on uh, today. Um, but the, the bottom line is, you know, if, if folks are in the business of uh, property manage management to make money um, and to kind of keep things rolling along, um, it wouldn't make sense to really um, invite a complaint. I guess I, I'm just, you know, as a layperson, it seems like you'd want to kind of err on the side of not, not inviting complaints and costing yourself money. So, you know, however you feel about some of those things, whether it's just you agree with the state or federal position on that, um, anybody can file a complaint against anybody for any reason, really. So why, why invite that? Um, yeah, so it here's down one. To, I think one of our, your, your hit on what has been one of our themes throughout this, you know, realize the things you can't control. Yeah. Don't get frustrated or lose sleep on those. Realize the things you can control focus on doing a good job there. That's the best way through this. And part yeah. of that is picking your battles carefully. Um, uh, and yeah. And, and the, other, the other thing that we've used in the Fair Housing Forum for years is the idea, you know, as far as um, language spoken, we always say, you know, cu good customer services in any language. And you know, I, but I think you can extend that to all tenants. You know, everybody appreciates good customer service and being treated with respect and feeling welcome and safe and all that kind of stuff. Um, here's how many one. complaints I've seen where it started because of uh, someone taking an attitude with a tenant uh, for some reason, whatever the reason, and yeah. that five-minute interface where you know, customer service and, and uh, taking a deep breath and maybe being more reserved would have prevented it all. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Unreasonableness creeps into the conversation and it goes bad from there. Yeah, things can go south. So we have a question about, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'd like to just interject that, you know, I, I think if you were to, to ask David and I point by point, you know, are there any protected classes that you have a problem with or, you know, I don't have a problem with the fair housing law. All right. I, I believe in most of it. And I, I think you'd sound pretty bad talking about a position that favored discrimination against almost all the protected classes, if not all. Uh, it's, it's really not not pleasant uh, rhetoric. Uh, where, where we defend these cases, or at least where I defend the cases, and I'm sure David would agree, is is the how the allegations fit into the law and what the real facts are. You know, I don't, I don't ever get a fair housing case. And like I said, I've handled a lot. I, I think it's got to be a couple hundred uh, over 30 years. But I don't ever have, file, handle a fair housing case uh, saying that, that uh, I don't agree with the, the law that they're citing. <laughs> that isn't what we do. Uh, it's rare that I say they don't have standing to make a claim. It's, it's more often that I say, 
they're not telling you all the facts. And if you were to know all the facts, the facts as applied by the law would show that my client's not engaging in discrimination. Uh, I'm certainly not going to champion a landlord that has a, an affirmative policy of, of harsh discrimination. It's offensive. It's offensive to me. It's offensive to David. It's, it's not the way we want to live as people, you know, and, and I don't, I don't have any problem sitting down with Zoanne Olson or Ken Nagy. I get along with them great, and I think David does too. They're good, fun people, and uh, and they're just like you and I. You know, uh, they got a job to do, and we got a job to do. And sometimes those uh, don't necessarily align as much as we'd like. Uh, but I don't think anybody thinks that discrimination is okay in this. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we would if yeah, um, and I've talked classes with Intermountain Fair Housing Council, uh, bringing the landlord's perspective to the, to the uh, conference. And, you know, we would agree probably 95% or more on what the law says and what it requires. The disagreement comes when you then turn around and apply it to specific facts. Um, and, and you know, I think the segue is into two, and we're talking about preventing uh, from getting in trouble. But we've also got to mention if you if you're a manager or management company, and you realize you've made a mistake, and um, uh, you know, I guess there's that small mistake that you know never comes back to bite you. But if you get a sense you've made a mistake. One, learn from it so you don't repeat it and those around you don't repeat it. But two, if you get a sense that it's coming back around, get some help. Um, I think a lot of people out there, certainly small companies, small providers are in a small office, don't have the opportunity to get a lot of bounce back and feedback from other people and other perspectives on, you know, what should I do in this situation? And uh, these things don't get better with time typically, um, but a good lawyer uh, can help you be proactive, gather the information you need and be prepared to defend it. And if not, show that a mistake was made, but it's not a Fair Housing Act violation. If you can't show that, at least you can minimize the consequence to it and uh, it's invaluable. Um, so learning from our mistakes would be another theme, I think. Yeah. So I think that's you... good, David. Uh, one of the things I'd like to interject real quick, Eric, before we move on is uh, I see a lot of clients where uh, they have an on-site manager that trips and makes a mistake, does says something. I had a case the other day where they, uh, they got short-staffed, affordable housing complex, throws a uh, maintenance person into the management office for a couple of days. Uh, they get a call and somebody says, hey, can I have an animal on the second floor? And the person says, well, we really like to have all, we grant accommodations, but we really like to have all the animals on the first floor so they can be let out of the building really easily. We think that's a better fit and they get sued. And, and, I, and where I'm going with this is there's a frequently a knee-jerk reaction from the landlord to fire the agent, the managing agent that makes the, that trips up and makes the mistake that invites the fair housing case. And I get a lot of cases where that's happened and I no longer have anybody with personal knowledge of the facts because they've canned, they've terminated the employment with the manager and the, the landlord thinks that they are then gonna look great to HUD or human rights commission or whoever because they took action to remove the bad actor. Well, it doesn't work that way. The liability flows up and that person that did this acted on your behalf, whether you fired them later or not. And you're not gonna be able to argue very easily that they were outside the scope of their job and acting without apparent authority unless they were on a lark or engaging in some sort of overtly criminal conduct that was absolutely against what their marching orders were. And, uh, and we need to preserve that testimony in a lot of situations. And uh, David made a great point about reaching out early on. And I always talk about it in the context of baking a cake. I can help you a lot with this cake when you're making the batter. I can help you a lot when we're, before we put it in the oven. 
But once you shove that cake in the oven and start baking it, I'm not going to be able to do much but maybe change the complexion by putting some icing on it and making it look a little different. But it, if it has white icing and it's chocolate cake, it's still a chocolate cake, and, I, and the, all the icing in the world isn't going to uh, change the complexion of it. So reach out to counsel early. Reach out often. You'll save a ton of money by getting triage counsel early on before the thing exacerbates and blows into a whole big deal. And I, I'll get some clients that will bring me a housing discrimination case after they've already responded to it. And I'm like, what in the world are you bringing me this for now? You've already made your bed. You've already baked your cake. Well, you just want me to tell you how good it tastes or something or what, you know? Uh, so reach out early on, get counsel before you, you uh, jump on the grenade yourself. Yeah. A band-aid okay, so costs a lot less than surgery. That's right. So let's, um, let's shift gears here a little bit. We do have a couple questions or, you know, a couple folks that referenced this. Uh, can you talk a little bit about COVID-19 and unit inspections? Can a tenant refuse inspection at this point? And, uh, you know, then another person follows up and says this relates to the comment, uh, let's see, inspections. Can tenants refuse servicemen or service people to go in for repairs to the unit? So one's um, kind of COVID related and one's sort of general. Yeah. Um, you know, this comes up and usually the best solution is to try and work it out. I mean, one solution is, um, uh, you know, you assure them everybody who comes in is wearing a mask. Um, allow the, you know, to do it when they're absent. Uh, from the apartment, if that would make them feel better, or they can be in a back bedroom and you'll isolate um, uh, to a certain area. Um, so I think before you tell them, no, we're coming in anyway, you try and, and reach some understanding. Uh, you know, if they tell you, well, we don't want you coming in because two days ago, uh, we were diagnosed as having COVID. Well, that's a you know different yeah. circumstance. But ultimately, let's say you try and work it out. They're not willing to work it out at all. It's just an absolute refusal. You can't come in. Um, you know, you have a right to come in. If somebody you know barricades the door and won't let you in, they're interfering with your management of the property. Your lease probably says you have the right to inspect. Um, and, and their individual help should always be a concern, but shows the health and safety of everybody else in that building. Let's say you're going in to uh, inspect smoke detectors and change batteries. I mean, does somebody keep you from doing that if they refuse all your, your steps to try and get in there and it's just a blanket refusal? Um, I say, no, you've got a right and an obligation even to go in and do um, life and safety type of, of work and they're interfering if they uh, try to stop you. Yeah. Okay. I try and, to uh, Eric, Eric's got something to add to that. So, so when you convey a tenancy, you're actually making a conveyance of land and the land, the tenant holds the property to the exclusion of the world, including the landlord. The landlord should, serve, should reserve a right of entry through the lease and the rules specifying uh, the terms and conditions upon which they can enter and inspect. And I think that's really important. If the tenant frustrates your right of entry, I think there are a couple key things here. One, I would want to document in writing when I, att when I attempted to enter and give advance notice in writing of my intent to enter. And I think that's first and foremost. And then if the tenant obstructs your right of entry unreasonably, which I don't think having COVID is necessarily an unreasonable obstruction of your right of entry, I think you try to reschedule the right of entry. You try to set up another, right, uh, another notice of intent to enter at a different time and let them challenge that. And then I would expect you to document your attempted entry being frustrated again. And to the extent that this is the, the entry is intended to remedy a defect in the property because they've given you some sort of notice that the stove has failed or plumbing's failed, 
I would keep documenting my attempts to enter and the frustration of my attempts to enter. And that's gonna have a, a real good exculpatory effect for you with respect to that documentary evidence, because you're gonna be able to prove that the tenant has obstructed your right of entry and then relieved you of any kind of burden for repair that you might have because they, you've got a good paper trail showing you tried to get in and that they refused, unreasonably refused to allow you in. And uh, so I think there's some real uh, value of documenting those attempts to enter. And then ultimately you may be able to, to use that refusal to allow you entry after notice uh, as a basis to issue a comply or vacate notice or uh, ultimately support uh, a termination of tenant if it's, uh, keeps going on uh, to a ridiculous level. But I think it's all about your documentation and building up uh, what you've tried to do that they've unreasonably frustrated it, show that you've tried to get alternative times to enter and uh, and tried to work through it kind of like David was talking about and that they are continuing to frustrate that right of entry. And in every case I ever bring, I'm trying to motivate the judge or the jury to believe that my client's engaging in reasonable conduct and doing the right thing. And it's the other side that's misbehaving. And I, and I think if you keep that in the back of your head, it's, uh, you can navigate through these issues. So I've got a more of a comment here, I think, you know, and it relates back to um, kind of dealing with, you know, kind of difficulties or conflict and doing it in a way that's not gonna escalate. And it's just an observation that some tenants can be difficult people turned red in the face, uh, red face many times, best to let the tenant know you'll need to address the situation later if it's heated and then regroup. And I think that's always a good, you know, sort of uh, just kick, get the temperature down a little bit. And, uh, you know, you know, let's, let's talk about this. I'm going to research this. I understand what you're saying, Eric, take it away. We got, we got eight minutes left. I was just going to say that uh, I frequently tell my clients or advise my clients to issue their compliance notice before they have dialogue so they don't get hit with a restraining order alleging that they've uh, done something inappropriate or said something inappropriate. Uh, and then to just tell the people, hey, we like you as a tenant. We don't have a problem. Uh, we have a problem with this conduct. The conduct can't come on or can't keep going on. We got to we got to curtail this conduct. But we'll work with you and we'll try to, you know, try to appease this, try to de-escalate the situation. I think those conversations are best had probably 24 hours after the issuance of the notice when somebody can kind of cool down, have a chance to digest what's been given to them. They're not going to just be reacting in a real hostile manner. Uh, I think you got to be smart and admit it and enforcing tenant duties. Uh, I think that these situations can be volatile and exacerbated if they're mishandled. But I do believe you've got to lead with your, your state law notices and, and frame the relationship the right way so that it doesn't flip on you and the tenant doesn't get the, the cart before the horse. Yeah. And but, I just want to throw out something that's sort of just my personal experience. So back in 1998, uh, I started IHFA's Housing Resource Information Line. And since then, I've probably spoken to 30, 35,000 people from all over the state, mostly tenants. And, you know, in that comment that some tenants can be difficult, you know, human beings can sometimes be difficult. And I've heard so many stories uh, from both sides, from all sides of this equation. And one thing I just want to throw out there is, um, you know, in the last few years, uh, I hear more and more from people who are going to be first time homeless because Housing costs have gone up so much faster than wages. I know a lot of tenants are super stressed out and really feeling insecure about their housing. And that's, that's a recipe for high emotions and, and uh, you know, people feeling pretty, uh, you know, vulnerable. And so I guess my advice, and there's difficult people on all sides of the equation, you know, um, I think I, I, I've learned that over the years. Um, but I think it's really important to just treat each other as human beings and you know, figure out like, how can we, you know, how can we get through whatever challenge we have right now? Um, you know, let me hear what you need. I'll tell you what I need. Um, and then let's figure out a solution. Well, um, part of it, you know, yeah. yeah, part of it is, you know, don't get discouraged and realize if you need a pick me up that somewhere around 95% of your uh, residents appreciate everything that you do and Absolutely. your hard work and uh, whether they tell you or not, 
they like where they live. There's going to, you know, there's going to be 5% that will cause 95% of your problems. And uh, you can't let that be what rules your work life. You know, the, the, the most important thing in the morning when you get up and go to the office is that 95% appreciate the job you do. And, yeah. Amen. And, and I, I appreciate the job everybody's too. I just want to let everybody out there know how much I appreciate great property managers and great providers and great, you know, service providers and shelter providers. Cause boy, I refer people to you all, all the time. And, uh, and I, it's nice to know that there are nice, good people on the other side of the phone. Yeah, Eric. I was just going to echo on what David was saying. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of times where I'll, I'll get a property that'll have a bad tenant that's really raising cane and, and uh, cause a lot of havoc at the property. And a, a lot of times I'll engage those situations by trying to uh, essentially develop the public relations of the good tenants at the property and the good vibe at the property. I'll try to bolster that, make sure the landlord's giving back to the, the rest of the tenants and, uh, and try to get the good tenants to help expel the bad tenant conduct by uh, just showing, hey, you know, all your allegations about this place, uh, we, we're, not, we're not backing you up on that. We don't think this is going on. We don't think these, uh, these conditions or these, uh, these situations you're alleging are accurate. Uh, depictions of what's really happening here. And I think there's a, I think you can really run with that. And, uh, and I applaud everybody in this industry. It's a necessary industry and it's getting tougher every year. Um, I try to get, a, I try to keep uh, the, uh, the hopes and dreams of a lot of my clients alive uh, because I get a lot of managers that are frustrated with the events and, and frustrated with some of what they perceive to be limitations on their, their ability to control situations. And, uh, and I try to get everybody to realize, hey, you, you've never been more important. You've never been more valuable. Uh, this industry is getting tougher, but that just means that you have more job security and, uh, and you just need to be as good as you can be. Uh, but we need housing people. We need, the, we need this industry to thrive. And uh, we need good people that are the, these types of folks and, that are involved in these chats. Yeah, you wouldn't be here if you weren't concerned and interested. And, uh, and I, applaud, I applaud the audience for uh, reaching out for this type of training and stuff. Okay, and I just put a couple more um, links in the chat. Um, thanks, Gary. Uh, one is a link to housingidaho.com. I know a lot of people uh, list on that already. Uh, I just checked today and as of yesterday, there were 95 units available out of 20,602 units statewide. So our rental vacancy rates are so thin right now, um, it's, it's pretty alarming and, uh, and that, that worries me. Um, so people are really anxious to find stable housing. Um, the other thing I've, I put in there is a, a link to our uh, housing preservation program. Uh, it's for people who have lost income due to COVID and may need help with um, rent or utilities in the short term. Um, it, landlords and property managers can, can work with tenants and help them apply for that. Uh, it, makes, it makes you whole and it helps them kind of get through a, a rough patch here. So um, again, thanks to everybody who participated today. Big thanks to um, Eric Steven and Dave Penny. Um, I, Really appreciate you guys in this process and uh, couldn't have done it without you. And i um, glad you're there to kind of help everybody through through their rough patches, <laughs> you know. Um, so take, take advantage of all the great information that's online. Um, I will upload uh, this uh, recording to fairhousingforum.org uh, to the page for um, this webinar and as well as the chat. Uh, and as well as other links to um, resources we've discussed today. So uh, thanks very much, everybody. And uh, just remember, money back guarantee, if not fully, you know, uh, content with the with the the process. Don't forget <laughs> that free set of knives that Eric. Free set of steak knives. That's right. <laughs> okay. All right, you guys. Thanks, thanks everyone, so and uh, have a great spring.